Uh, good morning. Uh, I am not Terry Road Larson, uh, who you were expecting here. Uh, uh, I am Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm filling in for Terry, uh, who could not be here due to a last minute change, and also uh, George Way, um, the President of Liberia, also due to a last minute schedule change, is not here, but we're very happy to have His Excellency Bezongar Finley, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Libya, in his place. Um, dear friends, uh, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I should have started that way. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to IPI and to today's conversation with the Foreign Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Liberia, Benzangar Finley. Uh, this morning, this event is organized together in partnership with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. Uh, Excellency, it is an honor to host you here at the International Peace Institute as part of our Global Leaders series. This series has featured several heads of state and foreign ministers in recent years. In 2012, IPI was honored to host your former president, Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. So it gives us great pleasure to continue this relationship with the Republic of Liberia. In October and December 2017, the people of Liberia went to the polls and shepherded a peaceful transition of political and administrative power, the first in the country's post-conflict era. Three months later, the UN mission in Liberia, UNMIL, formally concluded its peacekeeping mandate after nearly 15 years of work in the country. These successful transitions underscore the momentous progress achieved by Liberians during the country's post-war recovery, backed by strong support from the UN and international partners. But of course, there is more work to be done as Liberia continues steadily on the path towards sustainable development and enduring peace. During the Liberia Moment Conference this past March, your president, President Weah, outlined the guiding vision for Liberia's pro-poor agenda for prosperity and development. He stressed that this new framework will benefit the vulnerable, promote inclusion, and align with the sustainable development goals. Liberia's government has worked hard in recent months to advance and finalize this new development agenda. And Minister, we look forward to hearing from you today your reflections on your country's peace building and development goals. After the keynote presentation, I will facilitate a discussion among our distinguished guests, including Ambassador Olaf Skoog, Permanent Representative of Sweden to the UN, and Ms. Ahuna Eziokanwa, Assistant Secretary General and Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa of UNDP. Following their brief interventions, we will open the floor for a question and answer session. So please join me now in welcoming His Excellency, Minister Finlay. Good morning. Um, Madam Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations UNDP Development Program, Ambassador School, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Liberia Development Plan, the pro-po agenda for prosperity and development commonly referred to as the PAPD. is a five-year program designed to accelerate inclusive and sustainable development. In formulating the PAPD, we have recognized that for development to be pro po it has to be inclusive. All Liberians should have the opportunity to contribute to participate and benefit from national development. 
The <clears throat> PAPD rests on four pillars. Power to the people, economy and jobs, sustaining the peace and governance and transparency. These pillars are interconnected and mutually reinforcing. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, power to the people reflect our unshakable belief that the foundation of human development is health and education, supported by programs which reduce vulnerability, particularly among women, children, and youth. Economy and jobs focus on rising, raising the productivity and income of every Liberian working, creating <clears throat> an appropriate policy for the enhancement, competitiveness, and extending and upgrading the national infrastructure. Below three, sustaining the peace, address the root causes of conflict and the fragility by ensuring <clears throat> that the human rights of all Liberians are protected by the rule of law and broad base across to justice, access to justice, justice. Pillow four, governance and accountability. Highlight the capacity of the state to honestly, competently, efficiently fulfill its responsibility to all Liberians. For example, in pillow one, a worthy emphasis on infrastructure. With respect to the economy and jobs, the construction and maintenance of infrastructure expand employment and income, while transport and other services provide, provided by infrastructure, infrastructure make all economic activities more productive and competitive by reducing logistic <clears throat> costs for personnel and business travel, the transport of, of inputs and, and outputs, and the transfer of information. These advantages are critical for small-scale agriculture, raising productivity and income. This will directly reduce poverty and food insecurity through the rural areas of Liberia. Improve infrastructure, lower the cost, and extend the geographic reach of key social services. For example, health, education, water and sanitation. These are all facilities that access by the poor to the program designed to reduce the, their vulnerability. Better infrastructure is instrumental in helping sustaining the peace. It, it reduces the isolation, the marginalization by supporting broad community interaction and promoting regional integration. Finally, by improving communication and access to social services, infrastructure development improves governance. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, implementation of the PAPD will encounter serious challenges. Liberia is recovering from an effort and effective effect of Ebola and lower commodity price, excuse me, and lower commodity prices. The structure of the economy, the structure of the economy is distorted. Small scale agricultural productivity is low. And the benefit of upgrade infrastructure will not emerge immediately. Furthermore, our institution needs to be strengthened and we face numerous financial and human capacity constraints. To address these matters, we have built a capable state, something the PAPD stress. In view of this, 
A capable state does a few things and does them well. This is why our PAPD has been especially careful to identify the few critical things that need done in Liberia over the next five years. We in Liberia are determined to do everything in our power to realize our pro-PO agenda. But some factors are not within our powers. The task we see as essential to, to accelerate inclusive and sustainable development require resources that are beyond our current financial capacity. Due to reasoning <coughs> highlighted earlier, our capacity to mobilize additional resources domestically is limited and the need to maintain debt sustainability reduces our capacity to borrow. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the PAPD will formally launch, be launched at the end of this year. Work has begun processing deliberately and coherently to ensure that all relevant perspectives are considered and refined. Some thought decisions are required to determine what to prioritize and what to leave for later. We line as we proceed and re recognize the poor poor agenda will not will need to be recalibrated as implementation ex, uh, experience emerge. For too many years, including the recent past, Liberia has been an example of growth without development. With our proper agenda for prosperity and development, we have the means to ensure that all Liberians contribute, participate, and benefit from the nation's development that is only the way to maintain and consolidate our peace thus far. I want to thank you and leave it open for discussion. Uh, I would also like to recognize the Minister of State without portfolio, Mr. Chukwong Kui. Uh, I don't know if you can come up. He will also be assisting me in answering some of uh, the questions that will be posed. So thank you. I now have the pleasure of introducing an old friend of IPI, Ambassador Olaf Skoog, Permanent Representative of Sweden to the UN and Chair of the UN Peacebuilding Commission's Liberia Configuration. Olaf. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mr. Minister, Mr. Minister, Assistant Secretary General Warren, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always uh, great to be here in IPI, although I don't understand why you closed the curtains, because the view is, uh, is fantastic <laughs> out there. But I guess it's to uh, avoid distraction. The sun Olaf, is too strong. <laughs> That's a good Olaf, one. Olaf, it's because of the webcast. <laughs> if the light is behind, oh, I nobody see. can see the All webcast. right, OK. Oh, there's a webcast. Yeah, I have to. I have to focus. Um, look, um, we're here in a uh, hysterical moment, uh, this uh, uh, high-level week of the General Assembly. And um, you know we're running around from one meeting to the other, and it's a lot of discussions about the new threats, the, the new crisis that may emerge, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, cyber security, climate and security, et cetera. I just think it's extremely important that we do not forget um, issues that we have been engaged in for some time and that we sort of quickly leave them behind and start running after the next thing. But, uh, you know, the importance of staying engaged and focused in this case on Liberia is, I think, extremely important. So, so thank you to IPI um, and, and ministers uh, to, to be here to focus on that to discussion. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure of uh, chairing the Peacebuilding Commission configuration on Liberia since 2015. 
Um, and um, you know the, the the mission that I felt that we've had is to just to get mm -hmm. all the concerned countries, IFIs, the UN system around a table on a regular basis with Liberia. Um, to uh, address the, the, the challenges. And of course, um, you know, there's a lot of debate in the UN right now, the PBC's role vis-a-vis -vis the Security Council, etc. And we spend a, a healthy lot of time knocking on the door on the Security Council to try to explain for them, which is also us because we are now part of the Security Council, um, the importance of working, you know, uh, with the broader peace building agenda that the Security Council is unable to deal with and maybe shouldn't deal with uh, in a much more, you know, free and open-minded way. I think that is still work in progress, but I also think that Liberia is often, and I think rightly so, mentioned as a success, success story. Um, Liberia is off the Security Council, the Security Council is dealing with so many other things, um, and I think that just shows that you know it's a it's a stamp of approval of the transition so far. But it, I think it's also a call for uh, other parts of the system and member states and the UN system to stay engaged and and, and focused. Um, now. Um, Sweden is both a, a bilateral donor and supporter uh, since many years of Liberia. Uh, as I said, we're on the Security Council and we're also on the uh, Peace Building uh, Commission. But we're also a, one of the biggest donors to the UN system as such. And we strongly believe um, that that support um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is a good way of making sure that you know we stay uh, stay focused on issues that are may not you know on the daily basis make the headlines of, of the news, and we also uh, and here uh, I, I don't agree with President Trump in his speech yesterday. There might be other things I don't agree with with him, but you know he mentioned how they would move away from uh, core uh, funding to just sort of focusing on the things that they believe is good for America, I guess. Um, that's not how we see it. Um, you know, uh, Sweden first <laughs> would be, uh, you know, there's no contradiction, I think, uh, between focusing on your national interest but also supporting a healthy multilateral system and a strong United Nations is certainly in Sweden's interests. Um, it's in uh, Liberia's interest and I think it's also in the American interest. Now, um, we've had. Um, uh, I want to commend Liberia also for the way that you have, you, you, your government, the previous government, all the ambassadors that have been here during my time has been extremely engaged in the peace building work. Now some of that is difficult because it's about insisting on reforms that you know may not be so easy to conduct at home, but I must say the ambassadors here have been extremely um, constructive in working on, on those agendas. Um, and that is as opposed to some other countries that have not cooperated with the Peace Building Commission um, and have not seen the virtue of doing that. So I just want to again praise um, uh, Liberia for, for, for the way you have engaged uh, on, on it. Um, now, um, so the national ownership, maybe that's one of the lessons, uh, uh, another lesson that is so, that is so important. Um, you know, some, some countries see that the UN, you know, being on a UN agenda, be it on the Security Council, on the Peace Building Commission, it's, it's, it's intrusive. It's a violation of sovereignty. Uh, but I think the way Liberia has seen this is one, you know, we need help. Uh, let's engage, and I think that's that's a, a, a very uh, that's an A plus for for that kind of uh, of uh, uh, vision. I want to congratulate the government on the new uh, national development plan and the pro poor agenda. Um, I have been to Liberia several times, and I've been part of the consultative processes that you have staged where youth organizations who are very uh, active and vibrant in, in Liberia, women's organizations have been part uh, in preparing these plans. And I just want to congratulate you on the inclusive way that you have worked on that. And I think, Minister, you mentioned, and I know you are a, a, a supporter of civil society, having been part of that yourself, that that remains a, an important constituency in, uh, in Liberia as you move forward. 
Um, now, I also think that um, the SDG, the 2030 Agenda, is such an excellent plan. We are, in my country, uh, that's part of our uh, government policy. We've taken it aboard, ab uh, and I just think that the more you can uh, ensure that the SDGs are part of your national development plan, there you have an excellent master plan for avoiding falling back into conflict and ensuring development and equalities, mm. etc. So I just think that is an excellent um, a sort of master plan. Now, um, and I also hope that as the UN reforms and the UN system becomes hopefully more coherent, more effective on the ground, that Liberia very quickly could become like a pilot in terms of playing out and rolling out the Secretary General's vision about a reformed UN system and that Liberia could be the first example or one of the first examples to have seen that uh, in action. Um, I want to... Um, uh, also say that you know with what we're doing has been insisting with the government that you conduct uh, you you focus on peace building uh, reforms etc uh, you know that you uh, work on corruption that you respect human rights that you work on reconciliation and all that um, uh, and but I also think and, and those issues remain important as you said mr. minister but I also think it's important that we, uh, the international community, and I think that's what the Peace Building Commission can do, can be then a platform for making sure that we are also coordinated um, and that, you know, if we agree on what is important with you, then we should also be a coordinated international community helping you to advance, not having to spend unnecessary resources back home to coordinate us. Um, that should be our job. Um, and I do think, and I want to praise the Secretary General for his um, vision when it comes to working even, ever more closely with the World Bank and the IFIs because they, they have a tremendous amount of, of economic um, uh, resources to, to, and, uh, to uh, put to work. Um, now, there may be those who say that um, you know, the Peace Building Commission is focused on peace building things. Um, uh, and that's a narrow, it could be, you know, defined as a narrow uh, objective. Um, but I just want to, and, and, you know, there might be fear that if we, you know, if we force the government to focus on some of those issues, resources would go to that and not to other things that the governments may feel are more important. I think that is, uh, is a contradiction, uh, it, it's not true. It, 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 that's not the way it works, because I think if you look at peace building, everything you mentioned, Mr. Minister, education, strong institutions, good governance, working against corruption, inclusion, etc. All of that, of course, is a way of building a stable society where you avoid the pitfalls of falling back into conflict. So everything in your, uh, in your plan is also a peace building uh, uh, plan, I would say. Having said that, I, I, um, uh, uh, I also, um, a, a, another notion, uh, which is a, a good thing in, in West Africa and, and in Liberia is the progress on regional cooperation. If, if we look back 15, 20 years, the, how intertwined the conflicts were between Liberia, Sierra Leone, etc., the Nigerian influence, all of that, I think, is a, hopefully a, 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 um, a thing of the past. Whereas now we see a very healthy, forward-leaning um, regional cooperation through ECOWAS, through the Manor River Union, etc. And I think that is extremely positive. Actually, it's a model for other parts of Africa and certainly for the Middle East, where there is just no uh, regional cooperation at all. So I think that in itself is, is a good peace building um, uh, advance uh, as well. Finally, uh, looking forward, uh, I just think that the issues, um, uh, uh, I want to congratulate the government for having uh, now uh, acted on um, the uh, Local Government Act and the Land Reform uh, Act, both which uh, you know, have been something that the Peace Building Commission has insisted on. Uh, so congratulations on that. I, I think there are still some important uh, reforms that are, that are due. I just want to encourage those to, to go forward. 
You have mentioned, and I want to repeat, the need for strong institutions that are respected uh, by, by people, not just in Monrovia, but way out there in the countryside. Uh, I've been there, and Mr. Minister, as you know, and I've seen you know, the lack of, of trust between, uh, between institutions and the people. So there's a lot of work to be done on that. And I think corruption is one of the key tasks uh, that has to be dealt with. Um, and I, and I appreciate the focus that you, that you are putting on that because I think the corruption isn't just you know, about donors being you know, skeptical about putting money forward. More importantly, it's about uh, people of Liberia trusting their institutions and trusting democracy. So, so uh, that is, has to be part of the, of the agenda. I think, as I said before, youth and women, you, you possess such uh, richness in, in mobilizing these uh, groups. So I just want to hope that, that that is continued to be working with them. There is the issue of gender-based violence, which continues to be difficult in many parts of the world, including my own. Um, but I know it's, it's a very big problem in Liberia. Um, I, I understand that the act is not, uh, has not been passed yet. Um, uh, I might be wrong on that. But I hope that there can be legislation uh, on, um, to, to uh, work against gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and finally, uh, Mr. Minister, I s raised this with your president when I was there last time, and I think uh, the whole issue of um, the natural resources, the tremendous natural resources of Liberia, how they can be better used um, for the benefit of the people uh, through transparent concessions, through taxation, etc. I think that is uh, a work we need to do together. And it's not only about the government, it's certainly about the multinational companies and how they come in and how they in invest and how they ensure that they, some of that wealth stays in the country and, is, and that the people in the regions are the beneficiaries of that, uh, those investments. I think that's something I would very much like to cooperate with you and the new government uh, uh, as, um, you know, as you d develop your plan. Thank you very much, uh, Warren, and I apologize if I was a bit too long. Uh, Your Excellency, Foreign Minister Findlay of the Republic of Liberia, State Minister Trokan Kui, and of course all members of the Liberia delegation who are here. Your Excellency Ambassador Olof Skok, who just spoke to us, who is the chair of the Liberia Configuration of the UN Peace Building Commission and also permanent representative of Sweden to the UN. Uh, special Advisor, uh, Senior Advisor uh, at IPI, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. I want to start by thanking IPI for being such a strong supporter of Africa. Uh, over the years, this institute has invested in thought leadership that uh, contributes positively to the progress of the continent. I also, UNDP is really proud today to be associating with this institute in, um, in having this event. I also want to thank the ambassador from Sweden for his words of encouragement and for uh, Sweden's <laughs> consistent, fierce support for the UN and for uh, multilateralism. I've just come from working for the UN in the field in Ethiopia and there when you work on the ground and you face humanity up front you really begin to appreciate those who see the need to invest in our shared humanity. I uh, Liberia has a very special place in my heart because it was in this country that as a young humanitarian officer, I learned uh, a lot about the world and about our joined up action for humanity. I was there during the war uh, working and seeing uh, the resilience of these people. And today as we speak, at that time, Liberia was it made the headlines for the war, for the vulnerability of the people. Today, this event is insisting that we not only have headlines when there is a crisis, but we also put countries on stage when they are on the path 
of recovery and on their journey towards development. It was in this country that I felt the first pulses of the strength of women, the grace of women in the presence of war. It was here, many of you know the story of the Nobel Peace Prize, but I watched that unfold. And we believe that there are two groups of people without whom we cannot achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, women and youth. And today, the world has much to learn from Liberia, because in this country, we have a very clear demonstration of the recognition of these two demographics. One of the first countries in Africa to allow <laughs> and encourage a female president. And one of the first countries to also have a youthful president elected. And so with these two demonstrations, I think this country is on the right path to development. I think we should, we should take a moment to listen to what we heard from the foreign minister this morning. And I, I want to quote something he said. He said that growth in Liberia has been growth without jobs, that it has not served its purpose of conquering inequality and poverty. And that as a country, they were moving forward with an agenda that would be pro-poor, that would see this link between growth and reduction and eventual elimination of poverty and vulnerability. That coming from a government at a more senior level, because he's speaking on behalf of the leader of that country, is a moment we should reflect on. Because as the ambassador from Sweden said, our mission today has to be about seeing how the resources of a country serve its people. Enough of coming and saying we have a rich country, a rich continent that continues to beg for food for its people. And I think with this statement today, Liberia mm -hmm. is demonstrating leadership, a departure, a new narrative for the continent of Africa, that we move in the direction of policies that allow the resources of a country to work for its people. That is the development that we get behind. That is the principle of leaving no one behind that underpins the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. And for all of this, I stand very proudly as one of the successors of Liberia's former president, Madame Salif Johnson, because he, she actually was in my position in UNDP many years ago. <laughs> you worked well. <laughs> so I, I really um, am feeling quite honored this morning that we're having this event, because in many ways, it does chart the way for how we should relate to this continent, how we should relate to Liberia. It's about ownership of the development agenda. Liberia owns its agenda. It's about lessons from a very difficult, brutal history of a country that has journeyed through that path and realized what's important for its people. And I think our role here today is to ensure that we support this kind of leadership, this kind of spirit, this kind of journey, that we do not allow these gestures of the right kind of leadership in a country that has suffered so greatly to see any reversals. 
How do we as a community get behind this? I think this is really the key question that we need to be addressing in this forum and others that we will have. How do we get behind a country that steps forward and says, I want to do it for my people. I want to make it work for our people. We have learned painful lessons from our past, and we want to journey forward. And I want to really say here that we have an enormous opportunity as the international community to make it right. We have an enormous opportunity to get development right in a country that's ready. So let's do it. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, those were particularly inspiring interventions, uh, and we're grateful to both of you for them. Uh, before we begin our discussion with the audience, I would like to pose a few questions to begin the conversation. Uh, and Minister Finley, um, the first one is the Sustainable Development Goals provide an overarching guide for achieving inclusive prosperity and development. How are the SDGs translating into the Liberian context and the country's development priorities? And to what extent are they guiding the design of Liberia's pro-poor agenda? Thank you. Uh, the pro-poor agenda is based on the SDGs. Uh, all of what we are trying to do in terms of moving people from poverty to a decent living standard is based on the SDGs women, youth, uh, infrastructure development, rule of law, um, addressing corruption, improving institutions, uh, building capacity, all of those are based on the SDGs. So we are not, it's intertwined. Um, and, and we are still, like I said, we're still in the process of developing, but the concept of the Propo agenda is based on the SDGs. Would either of you like to make any comment on that particular question, or we can proceed? OK. Um, the second question is, the UN's peace building and sustaining peace framework played a crucial, excuse me, played a critical role in guiding the UN's transition in Liberia. What lessons can be learned to strengthen the nexus between peacekeeping and peace building? Which peace building priorities require additional focus moving forward? Well, the, the lesson from Liberia is, as you rightfully have said, Liberia is a success. Um, and as peacekeeping has moved from peacekeeping to peace building and sustaining the peace of the issue, Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to sustain the peace? If people don't have the opportunity to provide for their family, the simple things, um, housing, send their children to school, feed their kids, an opportunity to work or generate an income, peace building becomes impossible. Because you always have people agitated. What are the lessons now is that, that we have ended the peacekeeping phase. Moving forward, we need help to be able to sustain the peace. We have to begin to uh, take on the security of our state, our nation. We have to have the capacity to deal with, with um, um, all of the security apparatus, immigration, <coughs> police, the military. A, a, a very good example is, is recently we had a demonstration in Liberia, a peaceful march. No arrests, no bloodshed. Uh, and I think this is probably in the last 40 or 50 years of our country that we have, we have had that. It's to show you that the government is sensitive and willing to work towards a continuing peace building uh, process. In my mind, 
where we are now as a nation, uh, we have to start to focus on our education system, uh, the health system, um, infra infrastructure, and providing jobs or a means of income, generating incomes for the common Liberians. Excellent. Um, once again, if either of you would like to comment on that question, there are microphones here for you all. We're both wired for sound. If I may. Uh, uh, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, no, I think uh, just uh, two aspects to this. Um, uh, this transition between peacekeeping mission uh, and, uh, and peace building. I think the UN system still has to improve the way we see these things because a lot of you know, heavy-handed peacekeeping missions necessary in difficult uh, situations are going on, uh, high costs, etc., but without much investment on peace building. So they just keep on, they stay, they, they are prolonged, uh, maybe for good reasons, such as in the case of, of Liberia, where we had the Ebola situation and a dip in the economy and the elections. There was a, you know, a decision, I think a smart one, to prolong unmill for a while. But I just think that the UN has to improve the way we, we, you know, the, the, we talk about silos, and there is a silo mentality often, that peacekeeping missions are there, but there is not enough investment at this, you know, in parallel to build the kind of uh, you know stronger societies, avoiding a, a fallback uh, uh, into into conflict, in parallel. So I think that's the an, an area that the UN has to study. Uh, we, it's been successful so far in, in Liberia, but uh, there are still challenges. No, no, we'll go on. Uh, well, this last question is about what the international community can do, and both. Our speakers have already spoken to that. Uh, but let me ask you, Minister, how best can the international community strengthen its support to Liberia through a coherent and coordinated approach? Which institutions, mechanisms, or approaches are best positioned to drive current and future engagement? That's a tough question. Um, because peace building and peace in Liberia? It's really, really a difficult question to answer because there are competing forces for resources. Um, where you have all the institutions uh, have been broken down, the basis for education, the basis for health, especially in our healthcare system, the basis for security, uh, the basis for infrastructure to reach out to <coughs> to people outside of Morovia. They are all competing for resources. But with this government and the pro poor agenda have been focusing on infrastructure. So we really would like to see resources mobilized towards infrastructure. The president's vision has always been infrastructure, the building of roads, uh, the building of, of the electric grid uh, to, to produce locally that would drive costs down. So I think if you were to look at all of these sectors, the sectors that is most important and we believe will be a driving force to stimulate economic activity uh, will be the infrastructure uh, portion of, of um, sector of, our, of Liberia. Why? Because you're going to drive costs down, cost of living going to go down. You're going to reach out to the, to the uh, less fortunate. Um, you're also going to increase productivity and also an opportunity for people to generate uh, an income. So I think that would be where we would like to see uh, a lot of help coming from the international partners of Liberia. Excellent. Um, would you like to say something? Take that then, then I will, I will refer to it. Okay. And I think, um, just sort of push it. Yeah, maybe just to add to what the minister said, you know, Nigeria, uh, sorry, Liberia, I'm from Nigeria, so <laughs> <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> uh, Liberia has uh, 
adopted this pro poor agenda within the framework of the sustainable development goals is fully aligned and the international community i think has this framework that we we have all signed up to that is hugely ambitious um, it, it asks for us to go beyond the mdgs beyond just the minimum uh, thresholds uh, to indeed invest in ways that stimulate uh, job field kind of growth, um, job rich growth, uh, but particularly investments that allow us to unleash the energy and talent of young people. It's a country with a lot of youth. And one of the, I think, um, issues that's quite urgent and desperate in Liberia, many African countries, is the fact that youth are not sufficiently integrated into the economy of countries. Um, so I think a focus on uh, assistance, investments that recognize this population and open the doors to empower them, uh, not only to uh, find jobs, but also to unleash their entrepreneurial spirits. And we see a lot of this energy uh, in, in Liberia yet to be harnessed. So this is one way I think it will be important to invest. The other investment I think is also crucial <clears throat> is on the empowerment of women. Uh, and as I said earlier, without the women and the youth, it's difficult to see hope for the future. Uh, Liberia has extremely talented, powerful, strong women. <clears throat> uh, programs that tap into that energy uh, will help the government indeed to uh, to achieve uh, some of these uh, some of these goals. And finally, I think it's also about um, having some compact in the area of Liberia's resources that are tapped by the external communities uh, and having fair uh, negotiations and fair deals uh, for the exchange of these resources for the finances that the country needs. Uh, well, we now have about 20 minutes or so for questions and answers. Uh, I'm going to call on people, and I see the number of hands. Uh, Minister, I'm going to call on th three questions at once and then ask you to answer them all together. Um, when, when the person comes to you with the microphone, please hold it close to your mouth. We are webcasting this, and for you to be heard on the webcast, you have to speak right into the microphone. So I'll start here on the second row, and then right, that gentleman there, and, and this woman here. Um, Mr. Minister, I started... May introduce yourself, please. Yes, I am Roma Stibravi, president of NGO Sustainability. I had the privilege of working with uh, the former president at uh, UNDP Africa Bureau. We started on some small scale solar and when she became president, I was able to get a GEF, a small grants program going in Maryland, uh, Maryland, in Maryland province with a diaspora group called Marylanders for Progress and they're out of Washington. And uh, the question is, what support are you planning for diaspora groups who lots of enthusiasm, funding, and all the rest, and uh, we can continue to do great things. Uh, Ellen always met with them when she was in Washington, and I hope that you can continue this. I will give you my card, and I can give you the names of the people who are involved, but this is a wonderful resource for doing all the things you want to do. Uh, my name is Fred Smith. I'm here for Fiber Radio Station live in Liberia. Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs, well, we were expecting to see the, the president of Liberia, but you ably represented him. So the question of Liberia in the diaspora and even at home uh, wondering, what is the relationship between Liberia and the United States right now? We have seen our president 
uh, visit China, Europe, all other places, but haven't made an official visit to the United States because there are challenges. Uh, some of our citizens will be sent home in March. So uh, we want to know when will the president come for official visit uh, to the United States. And my second question, you adequately dealt with the pro poll agenda. Hey, look, you were reading my mind. I was about to ask that question. Oh, well, you gave some of the positive aspect of the pro poll agenda. But I want you to go over some of the challenges. We see some of the challenges that just happened a few days ago where uh, the, the journalists uh, were able to tap into a major part of corruption and other things. What is being done to end corruption? Uh, I want you to touch on that. And whether the president is speaking with the former president. And then. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Danielli of the International uh, Organization of Victims Assistance. I want, uh, two questions. Would you elaborate on the challenge of education? You were talking about jobs, but with the amount of youth and the need for training and help for women, what is the, the status of education? And the other is, what it, you mentioned health. What about mental health? Okay. Minister, can you well, let, three? But what I would do, I would answer the first and the last, and I will let the Minister of State with our portfolio answer the okay. second question, if that's okay. For the last question, education is a challenge. And, and where is the challenge? We have to train teachers. We don't have the capacity there. The curriculum needs to be uh, looked at problem there again in terms of developing a curriculum. Uh, the structure, the, the, the physical school setting, uh, there are challenges that require resources to uh, renovate and refurbish. Um, so those challenges are the challenges that the Minister of Education, the Ministry of Education is trying to tackle with right now by developing a plan how do we um, train enough teachers um, to reach this five-year uh, pro, pro agenda to be able to address edu the education pillow? The same problem with health. Uh, I think the last st statistics was about almost uh, 5,000 pressing to a doctor. Uh, that, that, that is almost impossible. So those are some of the challenges we are faced with. We have to train local doctors, um, even special, specialists we have to train. There's a specialist uh, uh, institution now established in Liberia. But we need the trainers to come in. But in the meantime, what do we do? How do we address this? We need to bring in doctors. We need to bring in some teachers. And, and I would like to say at this particular point, Nigeria has been sending us some teachers. Uh, to train teachers also. So, so there, there's ongoing bilateral talks with, with other countries that will um, help us address uh, some of these problems in the short term. Medium term and long range plan are uh, on the way and being developed by the Ministry of, of, of Education and Health. Uh, the first question, uh, yes, we would like to have conversation with, with uh, all of uh, Liberians in the diaspora that are organized, that are willing to go back and, and help Liberia rebuild, whether it's just adapting or providing one chair for a school or um, one pill, one malaria pill for, for a clinic in one of the villages. We, are, we, we will um, appreciate that. We will encourage Liberians to come back. Liberia can only be rebuilt by Liberians. Uh, there's no question in my mind about that. And I'm sure all Liberians are more than willing to help rebuild Liberia. Um, the president and the former president, Madam Salif, they have an awesome relationship. Remember, the president was raised by his grandmother. He's a respecter of person, and he respects everybody. 
And so the relationship is strong and even stronger. And I will go back to some of the questions you asked. One on the diaspora issue. Um, past leadership and president, they are set in place in politics in Liberia that is considered no go zone. One is the Negro descent citizenship stuff that people talk about. And then the next one is the dual citizenship issue that Liberia is faced with. And those are the two things that we targeted the first time we spoke. The president is saying that we need you from the diaspora to support us to make sure this dual citizenship is resolved. Now, we are taking your fight. You need to help support us. If the force come from the diaspora, because it's, it's only important, economically, it is very vital that our, our citizens that had the opportunity to have traveled during the civil crisis, that have come here and have gotten Western education and that have improved themselves, should have the opportunity to go back and contribute towards our society. We are asking the international community to send experts to help us. But there we are, we have Liberians that are denied of even coming back to the country to help. We are depending on you in the diaspora to help us fight, make your voice loud, even louder, that we can make sure this is resolved because it would take all Liberians to make sure we develop our country. I will also go back to the issue of corruption that you stated. Remember, there is an active investigation going on. And I will not dwell and go into the issue because there is an active investigation going on. But I will tell you what the government has done. There are two things that you look at when you try to tackle corruption. One is transparency, two, accountability. And those are the two things that the president did when this whole um, issue started. The first thing he did was to make sure, since we came to power, remember that there are a lot of things that have already happened. We have almost 20% of our government that is still on a tenure. Remember that. The central bank governor was on a tenure. There are other lucrative positions that are still on a tenure as, as we speak. So we had a government that is continuous, and we also have government officials that are continuous. You have to also uh, uh, um, notice that. But we are saying for, for accountability purpose, if resources were brought into the country, we want to know how much and how it was infused into the system. So that's the first thing we did. And that's one of the key instruments to uh, 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 trying to solve corruption. The second thing that we did, we said, although we have sovereignty and we have the ability to investigate whatever happened within our borders, we extended our investigation and asked for international uh, 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 people to come in to help with the transparency issue that when the whole situation is done, whatever findings that are going to come out, it will not just be something that the government said. It will be something that will be done in an open and transparent uh, 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 way. And so that's what we are doing to make sure what is happening is put to bed. And I will talk about one thing that the, um, that's one of, one of the uh, people, uh, somebody uh, 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 talk about. They were talking about, they heard that they are, they are each, um, the mental health situation. I'm very happy that you brought it up because it's one of those uh, things that are really affecting our youthful population. 
<clears throat> when people are idle, when there is no job, there are tendency for people to turn to the wrong things. And so I'm also appealing that the rehabilitation process in Liberia, I, I really would like for more attention to be put to uh, rehabilitation of you, sensitization, awareness, and this is something that we have already started. The first lady is actually one of the key um, uh, speaker, uh, I would say one of the pioneers of making sure the, the vulnerable and the forgotten demographic of our society has been looked at and they have been catered to. So I would say thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. We'll go back to questions. There was a woman in the back with a yellow jacket on. Uh, this gentleman here and this gentleman here. And we'll take three at once, uh, and I think we'll have time for three more later on. Please. Good morning. My name is Banky Brown Stewart, and I'm glad to be here. It's nice to see my old classmate, <laughs> the minister up there. We're a classmate in 10th grade, high school. So it's nice to see you up there. Thank you, my question is about reconciliation. Could, could you identify yourself, please, just for the sake of the webcast? Banky Brown Stewart. Um, the General Secretary of the Liberian Association of Northern New Jersey. And I'm also the chairman of TWP, an opposition party, but TWP USA here in America. <laughs> so my question is about reconciliation. The main thing, what, what, uh, where Liberia is today, the civil war. We, we, we heard, uh, we, have, we did a survey, and most of the Liberians are asking for reconciliation be between those that were criminally, brutally killed, 1980, which I, I happen to be a member of the family of, of three of the 30 men that were put on the polls. So we are asking for what, is there anything we are doing about reconciliation? And the Liberians are also calling for criminal court because we see that people in the administration right now, there are some senators who, I mean, did atrocities and they are holding key positions. And so people are still hurting. So is there anything on the agenda of Ms., uh, 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 His Excellency We are about reconciliation? Thank you. The second person I pointed to, it was, I think, I think you were the third, right? Right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Olushi Onigmide. I'm from Nigeria, enthusiast of <laughs> Liberia. I've been there like twice. I was there during the post Ebola time and worked some, did some work with IRX. I think my conversation had to be with the post Ebola um, environment. And most importantly, how the primary healthcare system was broken and the, 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 the whole fracture of the primary healthcare system. Uh, was as the first line of defense, uh, was not able to contain um, the whole crisis that got uh, to a sporadic level. The question is, what are you doing towards primary health care in Liberia? Most especially in regions, in the, in the hopper regions or in the, in the poor regions where you know that communicable disease can easily uh, break out and cause and severe damage. Thank you. Thank you. And here in the second row. Hi, my name is Ta Wongbe, and I'm a CEO for the Kana Group. I'm Liberian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. It's good to see you, and thanks to IPI for this forum. Um, <clears throat> you touched on something important, and I wanted to, to touch, uh, touch on it a little bit, but um, to the Liberian lady who talked about uh, the implementation of um, reconciliation, we just con conducted a survey, actually, that Liberians are actually split on implementation of the TRC. Um, and whether they should actually implement the TRC or not. So we're going to be sharing some of those reports later on this year. Um, you talked about something that's very important. You said about rights and, and, and trust between the, uh, the government and the people. Um, we're actually, uh, we work with the World Bank on a study. We do most of the research in Liberia, we collect large data, and we, um, we're about to release that, that study today. Um, actually this weekend uh, with the World Bank, and it was a human rights study. One of the, the, the core factors uh, we saw was Liberians feeling as if they are, they, um, the services provided to them by the government 
is almost like a privilege instead of their rights. And so there's this inherent distrust, and we know trust and peace, there, there's a lot of um, you know, alignment between the two. If there's lack of trust, there'll be some sort of like fragility in peace. And we're here talking about uh, in the IPI setting. So can we talk a little bit about what we're doing to improve the trust of the government with its people to ensure that we have lasting peace and sustainable peace? Thank you. Thank you. Minister, I'm going to add one question. Uh, someone watching the webcast has asked a question, and Hillary's about to tell us what it is. Thank you. This question is from uh, Boakai Jalaiba on Facebook, and um, he has a two-part question. One, uh, what is the government doing to restore confidence in public service? And two, what is stopping Liberia from asking the ICC to establish a war crimes court for Liberia? Oh, thank so that's, you. That's uh, actually about six questions, I think. <laughs> yes. But I, I think let me, let me deal with the... Um, question on the, everybody's concern about war crime court. I recall in 2005, I was elected to the Liberian Senate, where I served for nine years, and out of the nine, six, three, as the head uh, on our system, head administrator of the Senate, which is the pro tem. And I recall vividly the constituency I represented, I had 36 town hall meetings on the TRC report. And in those meetings, and this is a personal experience, what the constituency said to me, and perhaps if I can dig it up somewhere in my papers, that they wanted to forgive, they wanted to move on their lives are peaceful, they are not picking up their mattresses and running. But it didn't mean that people should think that because they wanted peace and because they were enjoying peace, that people will be permitted to commit such atrocities moving forward. What did they want? They wanted a town hall, one of the recommendations in the TRC report, there are several recommendations how to address moving forward. The town hall meetings, something like the style of Rwanda a situation. I don't believe that any Liberian that can say that one of our relatives did not die or suffer during this crisis. I want to see that Liberia. I doubt seriously whether any Liberian can say that one of their relatives were not also part of a group that carried out atrocities, whether it was through support or feeding the rebels. All of us are intertwined. And if we really want genuine peace, then we need to find, sit down, as Liberians and find a way forward. And, and, and it's good that uh, Ta had just said. That their study, and this was 2009, when I did my town hall meetings. Today is 50-50 almost, from what I'm understanding from, from, from Ta. If that is the situation, then we really need, as a country, to see what is the best way forward. Are we going to spend? in a country that, and I will address also through this, the, the a, a healthcare system that is broken down, uh, education system that is broken down, roads that is broken down. Are we gonna spend 100, 200, 300 million dollars? Reconciliation in my mind, and this is what I told Ambassador Tale, what was the, the UN? delegation in 2009, that reconciliation is for every Liberian to have an opportunity to feed the family, to clothe the family, and to be able to save something for the future. Yes, I understand the issue of, 
of war crime court. There are those who believe that we should have a war crime court. court. There are those who don't believe that. There are those who believe that we should follow uh, some of the steps in the uh, recommendation in the TRC report. And there are several recommendations. So where is the government on this matter? Uh, there's a, commit, uh, um, a, a commission that has the authority to implement the TRC report, the Human Rights Commission, that reports directly to the legislature. So there's a structure in place for that. What we need to do now is to let that commission begin to do its work. There are several recommendations that are coming forth from that commission. And we need to wait for that commission to come up with their, with, with, with their report and the findings. Uh, that would be on the, the issue with the war crime court. Uh, most of the, the senators that have been referred to has been senators for the last 10, 15 years. Um, they've gone through a process, and that process is still ongoing. It's not a one-day process. So we need to look forward towards the independence uh, Human Rights Commission final report on this matter. On the matter with the healthcare system, uh, Ebola basically exposed Liberia vulnerability in our healthcare system. It taught us that we didn't have a healthcare system. We didn't have a structure in place. We didn't have uh, the, the, the mechanism in place to be able to deal with even the common disease that exists. And so, yes, now the Ministry of Health is, is in the process of uh, looking at ways how they can develop a plan to be able to base the development and the sustainability of the healthcare system and healthcare delivery to the citizens. So we, 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 it's a new government, we're eight months old, and all of those uh, um, plans are being put in place. Uh, the teams are in place, and they are working towards coming up with a, a solidified report on how and what are the mechanisms that we need to put in place. The issue of trust in the government uh, and confidence in the government. You know, politically, and I will speak politically now, you know, I'm, I'm a diplomat, and I don't like to be a politician, but I have to speak as a politician. <clears throat> uh, you're a former senator. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Politically speaking, you will have these kinds of issues from opposition. And we expect that, that there will be the opposition demanding for trust, lack of confidence. And any issue, anything that is small that goes wrong, uh, will spark up that issue of confidence. But how is the government dealing with it? What steps are the government taking towards addressing these ills that are happening in the society? If you, if you follow this government for the last eight months, there have been <coughs> criticism of the government. You had a journalist kill. <clears throat> the government was involved. The government executed a, a, an investigation. It turned out the government was not involved. Uh, you, you, we had a situation where uh, recently you had uh, the situation with the, the, the container. What did the president do? He constituted a committee to investigate. Not only that, but because of all of the issue of trust and, and, and confidence, he had asked, he had reached out to the, to the international community, to our partners. Look, we have a problem here. Let's show Liberians that we are ready to be transparent that we are ready to be accountable for every action this government is going to take. We've done that. The investigation is on the way. In addition to that, even prior to a demonstration recently, the president had already taken a step. But look what happened in terms of, of the demonstration. How many people got arrested? <clears throat> Zero. How many people got hurt? Zero, and yet and still, you don't believe that we are committed to a transparent 
accountable and uh, 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 process in this government. That's the only thing we can do. What the government can do is to make itself uh, available to the citizens so that the citizens can understand and trust government. It is not unique to Liberia that citizens don't trust the government <laughs> or don't have confidence in the government administration. It's, it's all over the world. But government must continue to be uh, focused on deliverables that we have promised as, as a political entity. Uh, and so the only thing we can do is to continue to carry out our transparent actions uh, and, and accountable actions. Uh, and then we, 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 work, we work along with those who have issues of trust and confidence in the government. I don't believe that this government is unpopular. This is a very popular government, and it has the mandate of the Liberian people. I think for, for anyone to say eight months down the road that there's a confidence issue, there's a trust issue, I don't believe uh, that that is the way we need to go. I think we as Liberians now need to begin to understand and work along with the government. Because it's not only President Weah that is going to take responsibility for Liberia. Each and every Liberian has a responsibility to the country. And that responsibility is inherent in the fact that you are a citizen and by birth, you have to also take your responsibility as a citizen. And, and we welcome criticism. We welcome uh, uh, ideas to improve the lives of Liberian people from Liberians. And so we want to say thank you. You can see from the interest out there, uh, there is enormous interest in this journey that Liberia is making. Uh, we're out of time, so I have to uh, thank you for the forthcoming nature of your responses. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Skoog. Thank you, Ms. Ezio Kanwa, for your uh, contribution. And thank you all for your attention.